I'm John Moore, and I'm here with Alexandria Mellon to talk to you about our research into the security of Square Inc.'s mobile card reading device, the Square Reader. We'll also talk a little bit about mobile point of sale more generally, uh, and why that's an interesting and timely research topic. First, a little bit about us. We are computer engineers with a focus in software engineering. I personally got into InfoSec younger, uh, in the younger years of my life, and that turned into research with a number of professors at Boston University in malware packing, embedded device firmware, and collaborative encryption. Alexandria runs her own iOS development company and also conducted research at BU. Uh, she researched the security of TLS, password managers, and ransomware. Artem is our third member, and he can't be here. He's out of the country. All right, here's where we're headed. We're going to start off with a little bit of motivation and talk about mobile point of sale. Then we're going to jump into the specific vulnerabilities we found in the Square Reader. We'll talk also about how to prevent against these vulnerabilities and some challenges that Square faced in implementing fixes. So let's talk mobile point of sale. Mobile point of sale differs from traditional point of sale in a number of ways. We like to highlight three important differences and we call these the three C's. Uh, mobile point of sale is compact, cheap, and compatible compared to traditional point of sale. And uh, because of this, it appeals especially to smaller merchants uh, and merchants who are on the move, such as food trucks, coffee shops, salons, taxis, farmers at the farmer's market, etc. And a number of providers have recognized this is a, an interesting space with a lot of room for growth. Uh, and that includes Square, PayPal, Amazon, Groupon, Intuit, and some smaller providers as well. So why do I care about mobile point of sale? And why do I think that others should care? Uh, well, we've seen a lot of new hardware and software coming out in the last five, six, seven years. And it's compact, cheap, and compatible. So it faces challenges such as stricter size constraints, lower hardware budgets, and having to interface with phones that are usually used for purposes outside of transaction processing uh, in addition to transaction processing. Uh, which makes it harder to secure these new uh, payment devices. And the hardware and software is coming from lots of different providers. Uh, it's not just Square. And each provider usually rolls their own solution to this problem. Also, uh, the hardware and software is being rapidly adopted. We've seen a lot of growth in mobile point of sale market, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the kicker here is that these devices are handling sensitive credit card information of customers. Um, and all of this combined together kind of creates this potential recipe for disaster. Uh, and that's why I think everyone should care about mobile point of sale. Square says that we protect your data like our business depends on it, because, we, because it does. Uh, this is a testament to the fact that the reputations and livelihoods of the provider companies depend on the security of their data. So the providers care, of course. The customers care. They, they don't want their credit card information stolen. And we, as InfoSec professionals, care because it's our job to uh, secure these companies' data. All right, so we recognize the state of things, uh, the state of the market, and the potential here. And we decided to take a look. And why did we choose Square? Well, a couple of slides ago, I said rapid adoption. Uh, Square is one of the largest providers that we've seen. It processes tens of billions of dollars in that's US dollars in transactions every year now, and uh, upwards of 100 million in a single day. And the company's valuation has um, increased 100 fold over the past five years or so, and they've processed over a billion transactions to date. Uh, at the same time, Square is not an easy target. They have a bug bounty program where they've closed uh, a couple hundred bugs since its inception. Uh, and so we expect that given its size and its bug bounty program, that vulnerabilities we find in Square might uh, easily apply to other providers. And furthermore, that vulnerabilities we find will impact a lot of people in the market. All right, so how exactly does the Square Reader work? In case you haven't seen it, it's the uh, device you see here to the right. It's a dongle that plugs into your phone's audio port, and it has a magnetic head, just like you'll find in a tape player or tape recorder. When you run that head over the magnetic strip of a credit card, uh, the varying magnetic field on that uh, credit card stripe will produce a varying voltage across the leads of the head, which can then be decoded into bits that represent the credit card information. You can see here at the bottom a waveform from the beginning of a swipe. Um, and 
it's, it, it works very much like a microphone. It's just audio, essentially. And so by outputting that voltage to the microphone port, uh, the Square Register app or another app can decode it into credit card information. Now, earlier models of the reader, uh, the, the second version, and this is an, unencry this is a, an unencrypted one, um, they contain no active components, no integrated circuits. So it's essentially a magnetic head connected directly to the headphone, uh, the microphone import, uh, input of a phone. And later models, in the middle is the, the, the version three, or we call it the S3. These have active components that amplify and encrypt the signal. So um, the, the phone actually sees an encrypted version of the swipe, and the waveform is not coming directly from the magnetic head. And on the right is the S4, the most recent version of the square reader, and that's what we'll be talking a lot about today. All right, let's move on to discussing the actual vulnerabilities we found. I used the word unencrypted a couple of slides ago, uh, and hopefully that raised a few red flags. Uh, because it, these earlier models of the square reader are in fact insecure. If you are connecting a magnetic head directly to the microphone input of a phone, then that, the raw credit card information, uh, those in, encoded bits, are going to be exposed to anything that can get in the middle of the headphone input and the official square register app and square servers. So this includes uh, anything listening in on the audio channel, uh, and also any apps that might impersonate the official Square app. Uh, and this is a problem that was pointed out to Square by a number of companies uh, a while ago. And Square's response was to implement encryption, and they deprecated the old readers in the process and said that uh, they're no longer supported. And it turns out that we found this was not true up until just a month ago that you could use any of the older models of the Square Reader with the Square Register app and still process transactions. And we found that to be a problem given the potential for the man in the middle attacks. Uh, all previous readers continue to be secure for daily use. Uh, Square claimed this on their website up until May of this year, despite the fact that they had discontinued and deprecated the older uh, unencrypted readers many years ago, and even the initial encrypted reader uh, a year ago. So this claim can really violate the trust, which is sometimes blind trust that consumers have in these companies. And it's important to be aware of the claims that uh, you're making if you're offering payment solutions. Uh, next up, we looked at replay attacks. So um, whenever you swipe the card, it produces essentially audio, right? And the question is, can we record that audio and play it back multiple times to the Square app to initiate transactions? Uh, multiple times with the same swipe. And it turns out that we can't because Square prevents against that, and that's great. Um, when you uh, look at an encrypted swipe, you're not just sending to Square servers the credit card information in encrypted form, but you're also sending a transaction counter. Uh, and that's produced by an integrated circuit in the actual Square Reader device. Um, and the transaction counter increases with every single swipe for that reader, and it acts as sort of an identification number. Uh, and if Square servers see the same identification number twice, they'll deny the transaction. However, they're not taking things as far as they can, and there's still a little bit of insecurity here because you can play back swipes to Square servers out of order. What I mean by that is I can record 50 swipes, and let's label them one through 50, and I can send all of those except swipe number 30 to Square servers. And then many weeks later, after I've processed an arbitrary number of transactions with Square and made even more swipes, I can play back swipe number 30 and initiate a, uh, a, a, and complete a transaction for the credit card that made that swipe. And this is an issue because Square does have the information to stop this, uh, but they're not. They know that they have uh, an out-of-order transaction, but they're not preventing against that. And that allows a merchant to stockpile encrypted swipes and later use them to initiate delayed transactions where they can charge a customer an arbitrary amount of money, even on a different Square Register account uh, than the one that made the swipe, and um, use social engineering as necessary to carry out this attack. Now, we made an application that makes this attack a little more uh, easy and assist with it. Uh, it's a proof of concept. It's an iOS app with a, a web app, and it re will record the extra swipes. It transmits them to a server, and it allows a merchant to, to play them back at a later time. So let me demo that right now. 
So I'm a merchant and you come to me, you want to buy something, take your card and I'll swipe it and I'm talking to you and then I'm going to open up the Square app and actually charge you for what you, you intended to buy. You think that the, the first swipe was just didn't, didn't register properly. Uh, and then a couple of weeks later, um, when you're not looking, I'm going to go back to my interface and I'm going to use this special cable I've made to play back from the uh, computer I have into the Square app and I'll charge you for a dollar. Or, you know, more than that. And there you go. It'll actually still allow the transaction. And uh, we've tested this for many weeks after the swipe has actually been made and after having taken a bunch of other swipes between the time that it was made uh, and the time that we processed the transaction. All right, so next up, we're going to jump into some hardware vulnerabilities we found, and I'm going to hand things over to Alexandria to take it from here. Yeah. So Square isn't solely a software company, so we're going to take a look at the hardware vulnerabilities that we encountered, which their hardware is actually pretty cool, so it was fun. Um, we started by dissecting a Square reader, and as you can see in the picture, this is what it looks like when you open one up. There's a ribbon cable that connects the, uh, here I can point to it from this side, but it's not very noticeable. Anyway, there's a ribbon cable that connects the headphone jack to the magnetic head reader, which is in the middle, and at the bottom right is the encryption chip. Now, Square claims quite frequently in articles and on their website that they have point of swipe encryption. But as we can see from this image, that's not exactly true. At best, they can claim that they have point of swipe adjacent encryption because the encryption chip is not directly at the point of swipe on the magnetic head. And this is where the vulnerability we encountered lies. We did a hardware encryption bypass. We started by breaking open the square reader. It has a tamper resistant casing, which makes it temporarily fairly difficult to get into a square reader until you have a little bit of experience with it without making any damage to the outer casing. Then we initiated a two-phase system. You start by putting a jumper connection at the two co top contacts. There are actually a set of contacts in the top right-hand corner that you can probe with a voltmeter and see what parts of the circuitry they connect to. And if you take the two at the top, then you can bypass the encryption chip except for a little bit of background noise. In order to get rid of this background noise, all you have to do is either crush the encryption chip or crush one connection on the back of the ribbon cable. And crushing the connection is actually a much easier and more reliable way than crushing the ship. Here's a video of me actually implementing the hardware encryption bypass. It takes under 10 minutes to do, not sped up. <laughs> um, as you can see, even though they have the tamper evident casing, it becomes pretty easy to do it when you've had a little bit of practice and you can crack them open like you're cracking clams. And the tools that it takes to do this are things that you can pick up at any radio shack. It takes a soldering iron, some solder, a little bit of wire, a screwdriver, and a pair of pliers, and that's it. And in reality, that's things that most of us have in our homes already. When crushing the encryption chip, you just want to make sure that you maintain the connection so that you have, still have a complete circuit. And then all it takes is a little bit of super glue. You hold it together, and you're done. And it looks exactly like an encrypted version four square reader, but it's unencrypted. This is a figure showing the waveform from the square reader in different stages during the hardware encryption bypass. In green, you can actually see it with the encrypted signal. This is the square reader, the S4 untouched. We haven't done anything to it. Then in blue, you can actually see what it looks like when you have done that jumper connection. You have that waveform, but it's being blocked by that background noise. The last one in pink is what it looks like when you've 
uh, completed the entire hardware encryption bypass. You can see there's no noise and there's just this beautiful waveform. Now this is an attack vector in two ways. The first of which is a malicious merchant can easily use this to steal cre credit card information anonymously. Say I, I'm a malicious merchant, I go to the market selling raspberries, and I have a customer come up to me. All I have to do is take the now unencrypted reader, which to them looks like a completely encrypted reader and they have a lot of trust in, I swipe their card and they leave and they get their raspberries and they have no idea that I've just stolen their credit card information. There's no record of it because I could even never, um, actually there are two ways of handling it, right? Because what Square has done is they've deprecated these readers now in part due to our research. So the unencrypted ones. So there are two potential things for me to do after I've swiped their card and gotten their credit card information. First is I can pretend like I ran the transaction and they just get home and realize that I didn't actually charge them. They don't know how to find me. They probably don't really remember my business name and I'm in the wind and I have their credit card information. The second route is to just pretend like the reader has been having issues lately and switch it out for an encrypted reader and then actually charge them. Either way, it hasn't raised that much suspicion and they have really nothing that ties you back to stealing their credit card information. Also, this is a quick, easy, and cheap way to make a credit card skimmer. Especially for someone who's a layman and doesn't have much experience with this sort of thing, it can be very hard to make a credit card skimmer that's small and easy to use for them. This is something that you can buy at Best Buy for $10 and then get a refund from Square for. So the cost of it is virtually nothing. We made an extension to the Swordfish app to facilitate this attack. It records a swipe, it transmits the audio to an external server, it decodes the audio, and then it stores it, and then it also sends it back to the iOS app. And we're gonna show a demo of it. So, here it is. A lot of you in the front row can probably see that it looks exactly like the latest model square reader. Although we also have one up here where we uh, implemented the hardware encryption bypass but didn't put the cover back on if anyone's interested in seeing it up close after the talk. Here I have a card. I'm just gonna switch to hardware encryption bypass and swipe it through. And there it is up on the web app. Keep in mind the number um, is, the credit card is old, so don't get any ideas. <laughs> and we blanked out the number just for added security purposes. So we're gonna talk a little bit about countermeasures. And these countermeasures don't really just pertain to Square. They can pertain to any company working in this area or in a lot of other areas as well. The first thing for the software attack that's really important is to remove the claims of the old model security. If you know your product isn't secure, then you shouldn't be claiming it is. That's the bottom line. Uh, they should also enforce the deprecation of the old models. Instead of just saying it, they should implement it and make sure that it is bulletproof. Beyond that, you should definitely make sure that your products are um, easy to deprecate in case security issues come up. Implementing risk signals will help to prevent fraud so that you can easily alert your customers and you can be easily alerted that something isn't going quite right. Also, it would be important for this to decline the stale swipes based on a transaction counter. So if it's not monotonically increasing, don't let it happen. On the hardware side, again, enforce the deprecation. It's very important. It doesn't automatically resolve the issue, but it makes it a little bit harder, as we've seen, for a malicious merchant to utilize this tactic. Additionally, what would really help solve this problem 100% is just to move the encryption chip directly to the magnetic head and then pot it as an assembly. In that way, you wouldn't be able to crush the encryption chip or remove the encryption at all without destroying the magnetic head and making it useless. We disclosed these reports to Square in December of 2014 and received mixed results. On the software side, 
like I said, we reported it in December of 2014, and they triaged the issue and told us they had a transaction, transaction counter in January of 2015. They looked into recognizing the count out of order and denying those transactions, but found that it was difficult because multiple data centers can be hard to sync with race conditions. And also, they have a, a special uh, thing for merchants where they actually let them use the readers in offline transactions and with different uh, square register accounts. So that can be make, it make it hard to make sure that they're monotonically increasing. They implemented all but one of the suggestions that we have made here, the declining sales swipes based on a counter. They implemented the, they removed the claims of the old model security in May, and then by July enforced the deprecation. They had implemented risk signals, but they're still not declining stale swipes. This is understandable on a minute to minute kind of basis, but when it gets to the point of weeks or months, it doesn't make sense, make as much sense, and leaves open a huge security hole where, like, uh, why exactly would a merchant need to s play back a swipe after a month's time or two months' time? They probably want their money. The hardware side, we were not as fortunate. We're already aware of the possibility that someone might tamper with our readers in this way. This attack allows any malicious merchant to collect credit card information anonymously from their customers using Square's best and latest equipment, yet to the best of our knowledge, they have no plans to fix this issue. A few sound bites we hope you guys take away from the talk. We've identified software and hardware vulnerabilities that are separate attacks. And we really hope that you take away from it um, that mobile point of sale is a rapidly growing and really interesting area that has the potential for a lot of security vulnerabilities that have yet to be explored. Especially as we start moving away from the magnetic stripe and into contactless payments, there are a lot of vulnerabilities to be explored there. I want to thank everyone for coming. A big thank you to Professor Ari Trachtenberg, who's in the audience today, for all of his support. And please complete the speaker feedback surveys. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around. Otherwise, feel free to go. <laughs> Thank you.